Hello there, AP Environmental Science class. Welcome to part two of my lecture on chapter 16, Environmental Hazards and Human Health. We left off in part one talking about the dangers of PCBs, uh, and now we're going to head out and talk about some chemicals that can affect our immune and nervous system. So what is the immune system? Well, the immune system is the system that protects the body against disease. Uh, arsenic, methylmercury, and dioxins can weaken our immune system. Neurotoxins can harm the human nervous system. Examples are those PCBs that we talked about at the end of, uh, of part one of this lecture, arsenic, lead, and certain pesticides uh, are considered neurotoxins, and methylmercury is especially dangerous as a neurotoxin as well. So again, just some of these chemicals uh, that can uh, that can harm us. So what we're looking at here uh, is the movement of toxic mercury. Again, we spoke about mercury uh, with our, our core case study that started off uh, the part one of this lecture. Uh, so now we're talking about it a little more. Again, uh, the issue here is the movement of toxic mercury from um, the atmosphere to aquatic systems. So again, uh, basically the atmosphere or the aquatic systems uh, take in, right, or sequester some of that uh, methylmercury, and then it gets biomagnified as it goes through uh, the food chain. And then obviously us as humans kind of catch and eat the larger fish, and that could put this methylmercury uh, into our bodies and could cause uh, some toxic reactions and could cause some issues to our nervous system. So again, um, do you have to memorize all of this? Uh, no, but you definitely have to have a general idea uh, of how this mercury gets into the aquatic systems. And then again, that it does get biomagnified uh, as it moves up the food chain. Some chemicals that affect the endocrine system, all right, what is the endocrine system? That are glands that release hormones that regulate bodily systems. Uh, for instance, they control sexual reproduction, growth, development, learning ability, and behavior. So we have something out there called hormonally active agents, otherwise known as HAA. Uh, they're also called endocrine disruptors. They have similar shapes and bind to the hormone receptors. We'll talk, take a look at a picture of that in just a second. So for instance, hormone mimics. Uh, BPA, uh, bisphenol A, uh, mimics estrogen. So um, one of these days, uh, many of you may uh, decide to have children. Um, I remember when my children were growing up, one of the big things was to use baby bottles that had no BPA in it, right? They didn't have any of that uh, because there was a chance that that hormone could get into the baby's body and affect its endocrine system, which could affect the learning um, and the development, physical development uh, of that child. Uh, we also have hormones hormone blockers that just totally block the hormone. And then we have thyroid disruptors, uh, perfluorinated chemicals, PFOAs, uh, used to make nonstick cookware, actually has been linked to thyroid disease, cancer, and both defects. Uh, polybrominated diphenyl ethers, uh, ethers, excuse me, PBDEs um, in fabrics, furniture, mattresses, and plastics uh, have also uh, led to some chemicals that could disrupt and affect the endocrine system. So again, uh, just talking more about that mercury pollution, right? Uh, how can we prevent it? Uh, phase out waste incineration, remove mercury from coal before it's burned, uh, switch from coal to natural gas and renewable energy, uh, control sharply reduce mercury emissions at our coal burning plants, label all products containing mercury mercury uh, and can collect and co uh, recycle batteries and other products that contain mercury or again, any other of these um, chemicals that could possibly uh, disrupt uh, our body. So for instance, this is what we're talking about with the endocrine system. So normally uh, we have a hormone that attaches to a cell It basically they have a unique molecular shape uh, that allows them to uh, attach to uh, specific receptors. Well, when you have a hormone mimic, uh, we have these estrogen like chemicals, right? This would be what we're talking about with the BPAs that actually have a shape very similar to the normal hormone, right? This is what evolution does, natural selection, right? Uh, it, it, it has this shape. And so it allows it to actually get on the uh, get on the cell there, right? And actually can then disrupt the uh, product or the function of that cell. And then you have something called our hormone blockers that actually just block the receptor and don't allow anything to merge onto it. Um, and once again, that can disrupt um, the uh, cell's function, the development, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And that could lead to birth defects uh, and other major issues, especially in a growing child. So again, these are the things we're looking at. Um, 
this isn't a biology class, so you don't have to know um, this in detail, but you do have to know generally uh, how these uh, hormone mimics and hormone blockers work. And again, they basically just have a shape that is similar to the real hormone uh, that then just gets attached to the cell and the cell, because it's not the real hormone, doesn't uh, function properly. And then that can disrupt the development of the, of the child or of the human body. So what can you do? Um, Again, exposures to the hormone disruptors, uh, disruptors, how can we uh, reduce those exposure? Well, eat certified organic produce and meats, avoid processed, prepackaged, and canned foods, use glass and ceramic cookware instead of that plastic, uh, store food and drinks in glass containers, again, not in plastics that could uh, have some of those BPAs in it, use only natural cleaning and personal care products, uh, use natural fabric shower curtains, not vinyl, avoid artificial air fresheners, fabrics softeners, dryer sheets, and again, use glass only baby bottles or BPA free uh, sipping cups, pacifiers, toys, etc, etc, uh, when you are raising your child. So again, don't need to memorize all of these, but I definitely would have a few in mind uh, for a potential use on an FRQ. All right, so how can we evaluate risks from chemical hazards, right? So that's really the crusp of this unit. Obviously, you're learning about some of these uh, environmental, biological, chemical, right? We're talking about all these different types of hazards. Uh, but of course, in environmental science, we want to uh, evaluate the risks from the chemical hazard so that we could potentially reduce the risks, right? That's the whole idea uh, of this course, right? To, to reduce the risks uh, that polluting our environment are, are providing, unfortunately, uh, to the to the not only the human population, but to uh, uh, the all the organisms uh, on the planet. So methods to estimate chemical toxicity. We have a couple. Live laboratory animals can help us out. Uh, case reports of poisonings, right? We can look at poisonings and actually uh, study them. And uh, epidemiological studies as well can help us estimate how chemical toxicity uh, can affect human beings or can affect uh, other animals as well. Uh, many health scientists call for a much greater emphasis on pollution pre prevention, uh, again, to reduce our exposure to these potentially harmful chemicals uh, that are in the environment, right? We always talk about global warming, but we're not talking about the pollution that is uh, getting into our bodies from these chemicals in the air. And again, uh, we need to uh, potentially reduce that by reducing the amount of pollution. It's all connected uh, as you're kind of beginning to see. Hopefully you've seen already now uh, that we're almost done with the course here uh, already to chapter 16. So uh, many factors determine the toxicity of chemicals. Those would include the dose or how much of the chemical you actually uh, have in your body, your own age, your own genetic makeup, uh, multiple chemical sensitivities called M CSs, solubility, right? Can that chemical be soluble in, in water or other, other solutions? Persistence, and of course, our biological magnific magnification, right? As it, uh, the chemicals go up the food chain, uh, the uh, effects of them get magnified. So uh, we have something called the synergistic interaction. This is when the effect of two or more agents interacting is greater than the sum of those agents, uh, basically on their own. Uh, and then we have a response, right? A Acute effect is means an immediate or rapid response, while a chronic effect would be permanent or long-lasting. So, um, you know, uh, an, an, an acute effect would be something uh, you take cyanide, you're probably going to uh, die rather quickly. That would be an, a, an acute effect. Um, let's say asthma or some kind of long-term respiratory ailment, that would be more of, of a chronic effect uh, because it could be permanent or long-lasting. So looking at a case study, how to protect children from toxic chemicals. Uh, one of the ways is to uh, analyze the umbilical cord blood, uh, 180 chemicals found that cause cancers in humans or animals in uh, umbilical cord blood. Uh, infants and children are more susceptible to chemical issues uh, with toxins because they eat, drink, and breathe more air per unit body weight than adults. Their exposure to toxins in dust and soil when they put objects in their mouths, right? If any of you have been around any infants or young children, they're always touching their face. Um, so again, they could be more exposed to those toxics. And they also have less well-developed immune systems, right, to help fight off any of the effects of those toxins. So uh, infants, children, definitely uh, more susceptible uh, to the issues with these chemicals. And that's why we have, to, uh, we have to learn about it to hopefully prevent that. And unfortunately, what we're finding is most of those 
those issues or a lot of them are in our underdeveloped uh, poor countries, uh, which unfortunately uh, is the case a lot of times when it comes to the, uh, the detriments of, 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 the, of environmental science and of pollution and things like that. So uh, moving on, scientists use live various tests to estimate toxicity. So again, studies usually involve mice or rats. Again, there's another whole ethical right and morality argument uh, around that as well. We're not going to necessarily get into that in this course. Uh, but again, people do discuss, should we be using other uh, living things to uh, help us figure out uh, what we need to do uh, as humans? Again, um, but why do we use them? Because mice and rats have similar systems to human systems, uh, and they're small and so reproduce rapidly, right? And that allows us to see quickly uh, what the effects are of the toxin over generation and generation. Um, something called a dose response curve you need to know about, all right? The median lethal dose, no, known as LD50. Um, this is when half of the, uh, when you give, give let's say, a, a group of mice um, some kind of chemical, when half of them die, uh, that's considered the median lethal dose, right? 50% kind of there. Uh, that's what we consider that. There are a couple types of uh, uh dose response curve models. One is the non-threshold dose response model. Uh, the other one is the threshold uh, dose response model. And we'll be take a look at those in uh, just a second. How about right now? Okay. So uh, what we're seeing on the left is the, uh, non-threshold non uh, dose, um, non-threshold uh, dose model. What does that mean? That means that immediately when you put, give someone or something a, a, a dose of chemical, you immediately begin to see an effect. That's what the non-threshold mean. There, there is no threshold. I give you a little bit of the chemical, you begin to see an adverse effect in the body. Obviously, the higher the dose, the greater the uh, adverse effect in the body. Your threshold model Okay, is a little different. In the threshold model, there is an actual threshold. So what does this mean? This means that we give a, a creature, an animal or a human, some kind of chemical, and it takes a while for the effect to begin, right? So there's a threshold. If you only give a little bit of the chemical here, uh, there are no effects, a little bit more, no effects. Finally, when you get to a point, uh, a higher dose, now you begin to see the effects take, take course. And then again, as that dose goes higher, uh, the effects go higher as well. That is considered your threshold model of, again, these uh, uh, dose response curves. Because again, there's a threshold where the effects begin. The one on the right is called an unconventional model. Uh, this usually doesn't happen that much, but it could. So what is this saying? This saying is as the dose increases, the effects increase, uh, but then may decrease as you get more of the chemical. Again, that's usually not what happens, and that's why that's considered the unconventional uh, dose curve. So again, just understand how to read these curves. Um, and again, the LD50 is the, is the area where 50%, right? Of the uh, of the organism dies out, so that would be the dose above that dose. You're going to get more than 50% deaths. Under that dose would be less than 50% deaths, and again, uh, uh, that's called that LDS 50, um, or again, the median lethal dose. Um, of the, uh, of the chemical. All right. So again, understand these uh, more human methods uh, than using animals, right? Replace animals with other models. This is kind of what, excuse me, more humane methods, right? This is kind of what I spoke about a little bit um, just previously, right? So maybe we can figure out a way to, instead of using animals, use com uh, computer simulations, or maybe use tissue cultures and individual animal cells instead of using the entire animal as well. Again, this is kind of that morality uh, the discussion. Uh, should we be using animals uh, to help us with uh, disease and, and things like that? Because obviously we're killing the animals. So um, is that moral? Is that not? Again, um, a discussion that not going to have in this class, but definitely one um, that is out there and that you should you should know about. Uh, effects of mixtures of potentially toxic chemicals, difficult to determine, right? So if you get a uh, basically a potpourri of all different chemicals in your body, obviously a difficult to determine that, that dose response curve. Um, all right. Are trace levels of toxic chemicals harmful? Well, 
for most data, we find it's, it's insufficient, so we're going to need more research. Again, we are all exposed to toxic chemicals in trace amounts. Again, most of those chemicals follow the threshold model, meaning we're not necessarily getting poisoned or sick uh, from the trace amounts. But obviously, as those amounts get higher and higher, uh, the effects of that chemical definitely do increase. So here's just a list of potentially harmful chemicals that are found in your house. Again, don't need to memorize all of these, but I definitely would have a few in mind uh, if you need to use it for an FRQ. So for instance, your teddy bear, right? Some stuffed animals complain, contain flame retardants and or pesticides that obviously are harmful chemicals. Shampoo have some uh, perfluoro chemicals in them to add shine, right? Perfume has, I'm not even going to try to, uh, uh, excuse me, I'm not going to try to pr pronounce that, right? But perfume has this chemical in it, okay? Uh, there's your food. Some food can contain BPA. Milk can contain dioxins, right? Fruit, fruit, imported fruit may contain pesticides that are banned in this country. Computer, flame retardant coating of plastic casing and wireling, right? That's obviously a, a, a chemical. Carpet, padding and carpet fibers can contain flame retardants, uh, perfluorochemicals and pesticides, et cetera, et cetera. So again, don't memorize every one of these, but I definitely would have two or three or four in mind uh, if you need to use them on an FRQ down the road. All right, so why do we know so little about the harmful effects of chemicals? Well, there are severe limitations in estimating toxicity levels and risks. Only 10% of the over 85,000 registered synthetic chemicals have been thoroughly screened for toxicity. 99.5% uh, of chemicals used in the United States are not supervised by the government. So these are the main reasons why we really don't know a lot about how chemicals are affecting us. Obviously, we're doing studies now, uh, but again, as we continue to pollute our environment, we're going to see more uh, chronic uh, and acute health problems. Uh, and again, the idea here is to do more research, to be able to figure out these chemicals, what their effects are on the body, and then hopefully reduce uh, the amount of those chemicals uh, in the environment. So pollution prevention and the precautionary principle. So what is the precautionary principle? Uh, those introducing a new chemical or new technology need to follow new strategies. So what instead of the old way where you put out a product and then it's kind of safe until it's proven harmful, uh, the precautionary principle says a new product should be considered harmful until it is proven safe, right? So it's really the opposite of what we think of, right? Even with like law, right? We say if someone is innocent until proven guilty, uh, but what we need with chemicals is a new principle, this precautionary principle, right? New product considered harmful until we can prove that is safe. Existing chemicals and technologies that appear to cause significant harm must be removed. In 2000, the, there was an international agreement to ban or phase out the dirty dozen uh, persistent organic pollutants. Um, and again, uh, hopefully uh, that will help and we'll be able to see some of those effects now as we go through the next 20, 30, 40 years. In 2007, the European Union enact REACH, uh, which requires registration of untested substances most hazardous substances are not approved for use uh, if safer alternatives actually exist. In, two the, in 2011, our EPA issued new po uh, pollution prevention stand per, uh, standards, especially uh, those mercury admissions in those coal-burning plants. Uh, try to keep those mercury uh, admissions as low as possible. And the Minamata Convention uh, was the goal, was to, again, to reduce those mercury admissions uh, that we are seeing out there, especially as they get biomagnified in in our aquatic uh, ecosystems. So core case study, pollution prevention actually makes companies more profitable. So an example is the 3M company. The 3M company from 1975 to 2015 prevented more than 2 million tons of pollutants from reaching the environment. It saved the company $1.9 billion. Employee reward program for projects that eliminate or reduce a pollutant. So a lot of that money was given back to the employees who actually came up with these product uh, projects. And again, bravo 3M, right? This proves that if you prevent pollution, you actually can save money. Now, yes, there may be some additional startup costs, some capital you need to prevent that pollution. But once you do that, as you continue on, 
you end up saving money. So again, this is what we have to really start letting companies know. This is where you guys on the ground floor are going to be going out into the workforce in a couple of years. You have to make companies realize, the company you work for, that, hey, if we become environmentally sound, environmentally friendly, we're going to save money, which means we're all going to make more money, right? It's a win-win situation. Here's a case study that proves that win-win situation. So how do we perceive and avoid risk, right? Ways to reducing risks, become informed, think critically about the risks, and then make careful choices concerning those risks. So moving on, greatest health risks come from poverty, gender, and lifestyle choices. All right, so now we're kind of moving on from the chemicals and talking about those other uh basically ways of, of health risks that we spoke about at the beginning of the first part of this lecture. So poverty is the greatest health risk by far. Malnutrition, increased infectious diseases, unsafe drinking water, all lead to a reduced immune system, all lead to uh, uh, to uh, being having these uh, these uh, viruses and these diseases around, right? When you have the, the dirty water, uh, malnutrition, things like that. Uh, and so that unfortunately, um, creates great health risks for uh, people who are living in poverty. Uh, gender, being born male, is actually a risk. You remember that? Remember back from our... Uh Remember back from our cemetery lab a couple of a couple of chapters ago, right? We saw a lot of men die early in the 1940s because they went to war, right? So unfortunately, uh, sometimes being born a male is, is not the best thing when it comes to risk. Uh, and again, lifestyle choices, right? Overeating and smoking. That's something you choose for yourself, right? You uh, choose that go to, and choose that third uh you know, I go to McDonald's and I get a, uh, you know, a Big Mac meal, but I got to add on that extra cheeseburger, right? Well, and that's a lifestyle choice and that's overeating. Uh, and that could obviously lead to health risks down the road for me. Same thing with smoking, right? Uh, you're, you make a choice to smoke or not. Um, and that doesn't matter if it's e-cigarettes or regular cigarettes. You're making that choice. No one's forcing you to do it. And obviously... Um, that could obviously lead to severe health problems down the road. So this is actually a very powerful chart, guys. What this is showing is cause of death on the left-hand side here. Um, up here, we're looking at cause of death. But what's really interesting is this number in red. The number in red, okay, is how many fully loaded 200-passenger uh, jets crash every day without any survivors equals the amount of people that die each year from poverty and malnutrition. The reason why I think this is such a powerful chart is because think about the news coverage that would happen if every day 151 fully loaded 200 person passenger planes crashed with no survivors every day, 151, right? It would be wall to wall coverage on the news. Do you hear wall-to-wall -wall coverage on the news about people dying from poverty and malnutrition? Right? Look at air pollution. 96 passenger jets crashing every day for a year would equal the amount of people that die because of air pollution per year. Again, what would the news coverage be? Tobacco use. 82 fully loaded 200-person passenger jets crash every day with no survivors for a year. That equals the amount of people who die from smoking tobacco. Again, think about the coverage that it would be. That's what's so powerful about this chart. Because what it shows is that people don't care. And that's sad, right? Look at diarrhea. Diarrhea, okay? It's like the amount of people dying a year is like 10 fully loaded passenger jets crashing every day without survivors, right? That's insane. So think about that, guys. Great chart here, okay? On the right here, we're just looking at the number of people worldwide with lack of access to and adequate sanitation facilities, enough fuel for cooking, electricity, et cetera, et cetera. And obviously, that leads uh, to health risks as well. So again, very powerful chart here, guys. Uh, I hope you get a chance to, uh, to look at it in a, in a, in a, in a, in a little more detail. Um, looking at here, greatest health risks. Uh, again, these are uh, in the United States. So this is now the United States, the leading cause of death in the United States. Uh, some results are from lifestyle choices and are preventable, right? So in the U.S., tobacco use is the number one cause of, of deaths per year. That's totally, 
totally a lifestyle choice, right? Accidents, maybe not as much of a choice, okay? Uh, but again, you can see alcohol use, right? That's definitely a choice. Prediction drug overdose, right? That's definitely a choice. Um, so you'll see a lot of the leading cause of deaths in the United States are health risks that you can actually uh, uh, choose yourself not to add that risk to your life, right? Obviously, accidents, pneumonia, diabetes, infectious diseases, uh, you don't have much control over. But again, another another powerful chart uh, to take a look at and, and kind of understand. So court case study, I just spoke about it a little bit, cigarettes and e-cigarettes, cigarette smoking, most preventable cause of suffering and premature death among adults, uh, killed nearly 100 million people during the 20th century. Study also links it to a dementia and Alzheimer's disease. Nicotine is a very highly addictive drug, guys. You may not know that, but it is. It is almost as addictive. I think it is even actually more addictive than a, than a, than a than a, a cocaine is. Uh, caffeine is also another very addictive drug. You may not think about it as well, uh, but caffeine, uh, very addictive too. Secondhand smoke causes uh, health hazards. Not so much here in the United States anymore because in most uh, states you're not allowed to smoke uh, inside in public places. But obviously if you have a, a, a family member that smokes in the house, uh, that could be a, a major problem as that secondhand smoke just as bad as uh, smoking in that cigarette uh, firsthand. Uh, smoking though has declined in the United States. From more than 50% adults smoking in 1950s to about 18% of adults smoking in 2013. So again, information, right? A campaign to educate about the harmful effects of smoking. Definitely working uh, here in this country. And I would even say working overseas as well. I remember um, when I was in Italy many, many years ago, everyone in the country, uh, I noticed smoke when I went over there when I was 15, 16 with my parents. Then when I went there with my, honey, uh, with my wife for our honeymoon about 20 years ago, I noticed no. No, not many people were smoking even even in uh, Italy. So again, even in uh, other countries, European countries as well, um, again, uh, education is bringing down uh, that cigarette use, which again, that's a lifestyle choice, right? E-cigarettes substitute for tobacco cigarettes. Vapors, though, contain toxic metals. Uh, unfortunately, used by more than 13% of high school students in 2014, the European Union has banned the sale to minors. Um, so again, don't vape either, guys, all right? Don't inhale anything into your lungs. That uh, that sh that shouldn't be there. All right. How do we estimate risk from technologies? Well, we have something called reliability. So your system reliability equals your technical reliability times your human reliability. Human reliability is going to be much lower than your technical reliability, and also much harder to predict. So most people do a poor job of evaluating risks. Why? Well, factors that go into misjudgments of risk: fear degree of control, whether a risk is catastrophic or chronic, optimism bias, and instant gratification. These are things that make us look at a risk and cause us to, uh, to misjudge it. So what are the guidelines we should have for evaluating and reducing risk? Compare the risk, determine how much you are willing to accept of that risk, evaluate the actual risk involved, and then concentrate on evaluating and carefully making important lifestyle choices. Now that concludes part two of my lecture on chapter 16, environmental hazards and human health. And as always, I thank you for listening.